Well, they don't teach you in seminary what you're supposed to say on the first homily, but I'm sure you have your own criteria for which you're judging me, uh, so I hope to meet the criteria that's necessary. I can tell you I'm excited to be here. I can tell you my favorite color is blue. I can also tell you I'm a Cubs fan. So there, I've said my first controversial thing. <laughs> I've been a priest for two years. I was assigned at Saints Peter and Paul in Naperville, and I was the chaplain at Bennett Academy in Lyle. I can tell you that I love being a priest. I've learned a ton these two years, and I know the Lord will continue to teach me through my ministry here. I will certainly miss ministering to the students at Bennett, although I look forward to continuing to minister to the youth here at our youth group, our grade school, and our religious education program. I'll miss the many families I was privileged to get to know at the parish, but I also trust the Lord has called me to be among you, to get to know each of you and for Christ to be seen in that relationship. As I begin my ministry here, I want you to know one thing. My goal for each of us is heaven. It's for me and for you. Society is getting crazier and crazier. You don't need me to tell you that. But I ask that you would always trust that I have your best interest in mind, and that being to proclaim Christ, to always proclaim the truth, and that our goal together is heaven. I won't be afraid to speak of hot-button topics. In fact, I think sometimes this is necessary. But I ask when I do so that you always remember that our goal is heaven and society is not helping us get there. I desire to get to know you. If you invite me over for a meal with your family, it can even be Lou Mal's or Chick-fil-A, I'll be there. If you want to grab coffee, I'll be there. If you need help, spiritual guidance, have a question, email, call, I'll be there. I greatly anticipate getting to watch the Lord continue to work in and through this parish. There are several saints whose intercession that I seek on a daily basis for protection, guidance, and to be edified by. Over the years, I have read and researched many of these saints, but in particular, St. Catherine of Siena, St. John Vianney, and St. John Paul II are my three powerhouse go-tos, if you will. St. John Paul II is a man who ceaselessly fascinates me and who I'm constantly in awe of. He suffered from Parkinson's, a nasty disease that attacks your nervous system, eventually hindering your body from doing what's necessary to survive. It's a disease I'm all too familiar with. It took my grandmother's life after a 26-year battle. In St. John Paul II's last year of his life, that of 2005, he was unable to function in any capacity that he had desired. When the Triduum came around, as was the custom, the Holy Father would celebrate the liturgies, he was unable to do so. St. John Paul II appointed then Cardinal Ratzinger, later Saint Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI, a little slip there, huh? To preside at the Triduum while he witnessed from his house chapel. On Good Friday, St. John Paul II, at this point unable to swallow, to move, to speak, sat in his chapel, clutching, I mean clutching, a giant crucifix. The face of Jesus next to his own as he watched and heard and prayed for the church. Don't pull out your smartphones now, but I do encourage you to look up the picture after Mass. It's one that I consistently go back to for prayer and contemplation. St. Paul today in our second reading gives us the same example of what it means to be a Christian. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's common for people to wear a cross, to get a tattoo of a cross, to have a cross on their wall or hanging from their rear view mirror. The cross, of course, is a central focal point for our church. The cross represents something of extreme importance. And our, as followers of Christ, we are to take note. The cross is the symbol of the greatest love we will ever know. Greater love has no man than this, 
to lay down his life for his friends. On the day of our baptism, we were signed with the cross of Christ, traced on our foreheads by the priest or the deacon, followed by our parents and godparents. And they said the words, you're claimed for Christ. There's a direct connection between being claimed for Christ and the cross. And as crazy as it might sound, the Lord desires to live his life in and through each of us. St. Paul understood this in a radical and profound way. The cross became for him a source of confidence, strength, and inspiration as he continued to minister. Much like the image I articulated of St. John Paul II, it's a beautiful way as he was conformed to Jesus that brought him unity to the cross. We are called to, to walk closely with our Lord in our lives, that our lives echo that of his. In fact, as we receive the Eucharist each and every Mass, we receive the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, we become what we receive. Today, St. Paul holds for us the cross as the image of this reality. But I would also be remiss if I didn't speak briefly that the cross is the entryway to something much greater, something more profound than two wooden beams. As we know, the cross is not the final story, rather the resurrection. In allowing Jesus to live his life in and through us, we will experience, first of all, the crucifixion. There is deep suffering, tragedies, unforeseen circumstances that happen in each of our lives. A consolation during these times of suffering is to know that we're suffering with Christ. But to also remember that in Jesus' life, much like that of our own, these sufferings, these trials we will face, do not have the last word. Rather, the resurrection, the joy, the peace, the happiness that comes from the cross is what has the final word. So today, with St. Paul and St. John Paul II as our examples, let us cling to the cross of Christ. Let us boast only in the cross of our Lord that we may rise with him in the resurrection.